So our Old Testament reading is from the book of Deuteronomy, and it's uh, chapter 34, verses 1 through 12. And the book of Deuteronomy is essentially Moses' farewell speech to the Israelites before they cross o- over into the promised land. And so this is, this is the end of the book of Deuteronomy. So Moses has finished his speech at this point. Then Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo, to the top of Pisgah, which is opposite Jericho. And the Lord showed him the whole land, Gilead as far as Dan, all Nephtali, and the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, and all the land of Judah as far as the western sea, the Negeb and the plain, that is the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees, as far as Zor. The Lord said to him, This is the land which I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not cross over there. Then Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab at the Lord's command. He was buried in a valley in the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor, and no one knows his burial place to this day. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His sight was unimpaired, and his vigor had not abated. The Israelites wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. Then the period of mourning for Moses was ended. Joshua, son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom, because Moses had laid his hands on him, and the Israelites obeyed him, doing as the Lord had commanded Moses. Never since had there arisen a prophet in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. He was unequaled for all the signs and wonders that the Lord sent him to perform in the land of Egypt against Pharaoh and all his servants and and his entire land, and for all the mighty deeds and all the terrifying displays of power that Moses performed in the sight of all Israel. Our New Testament reading is from Matthew 13, verses 1 through 9, and then 18 through 23. So this is the parable of the sower, and there's a a gap in the reading um, because Jesus goes on a tangent talking about parables in general before explaining the parable of the sower. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, listen, A sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on the rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty, Let anyone with ears listen. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while. And when trouble or persecutions arise on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. Here ends the reading. So today's Reformation Sunday, where we commemorate Martin Luther nailing the 95 Theses to the the door in Wittenberg, Germany, which ended up kicking off the Protestant Reformation, and this is like a simplified version of history, but we don't have time to go into all the details about Reformation history today. 
So Luther's work eventually led to the Lutheran branch of Protestantism, but our own reformed branch of the Protestant tree, that's like us, Congregationalists, Presbyterians, and so on, that branch comes most significantly from the work of John Calvin. Now Calvin was a French lawyer who eventually found his calling in reforming the church. And he left his mark on the world through reforming the church in the French-speaking Swiss city-state of Geneva. So in his own day, Calvin was very influential, partially because he wrote well, but also because he took a lot of time to write people throughout all of Europe. Most learned men at the time could read Latin, so Calvin was able to easily correspond with people in pretty much every single Western European country. His most influential work is Institutes of the Christian Religion, which in Calvin's lifetime went through many editions in Latin and in French. And even 500 years later, I had to read sections of the Institutes in seminary when we were learning about reformed worship and reformed theology. So during the course of his time in Geneva, Calvin and all his supporters managed to transform the church there to resemble what many of us would recognize as more or less a Presbyterian church. Now, one of the most significant aspects of Calvin's reforms was changes to church governance. They reformed it so elected elders, people who weren't clergy, played a significant role in how the church was run. Now, we here at Middlebury Congregational Church aren't structured quite the same as a Presbyterian church. And as a congregational church, we've actually scaled up the role of laity in the governance of the church. So these changes in church governance reflect a belief in the idea that each Christian has the same access to God. And this idea later came to be referred to as the pre idea of a priesthood of all believers. But despite having a democratizing influence on the Genevan church, Calvin was most definitely the leader. He preached and taught and wrote regularly, but unfortunately, throughout his life, he would uh, often be in poor health. Many of his friends speculated it was because he always burned the candle at both ends, frequently staying up into the wee hours of the morning, furiously writing and researching. And if any of you are familiar with the musical Hamilton, Calvin certainly always wrote like he was running out of time. When he was in poor health, he would insist still on preaching, and he'd be carried to church on a chair, and he'd manage to keep himself upright long enough to preach, and then he'd be, be carried home again, exhausted. When he finally died at age 54, after about a year of illness and declining health, he and his friends and supporters were concerned that people might travel to Calvin's grave to venerate him as a saint and undo all the reform work he'd done. So Calvin was buried at his request in an unmarked grave with a simple funeral attended by many people in Geneva. And his grave remained unmarked until the 19th century when a stone was put where it's assumed his grave is. With our Old Testament lesson, it describes Moses' death, and he too is buried in an unmarked grave with little fanfare. And I can't help but assume that Calvin really liked the idea of being buried in a fashion just like Moses. So there are a number of lessons to be learned from looking at Moses and Calvin. And the first thing I'd like us to consider is the nature of leadership. Calvin managed to create a sort of cult of personality around himself, but at the same time he was very conscious that he wanted all of his work and reforms to exist beyond him. He took steps during the course of his life to ensure the work he did wasn't just about him, that there were other leaders and structures to continue things after he died. Despite Calvin being a little vain and fond of being the center of attention, he truly believed he was called by God to reform the church and that God was way more important than him. And there are aspects of this with Moses too. Moses was much more of a reluctant leader than Calvin, but he led the Israelites for 40 years. The people had seen him perform many signs and wonders. There was a real danger that the people would come to see Moses as the one to worship rather than the Lord. The work Moses did with the Israelites needed to continue on beyond his death. So he prepares Joshua to carry things on as the people move into the promised land. 
What both men highlight is an understanding of leadership where achieving the long-term project is more important than being in charge for just the sake of being in charge. They're leading people because they care about achieving an important end, a goal. And the movement they're leading is more important than the person leading it. So in terms of takeaways for times where we're in positions of leadership, one is if we want things to continue beyond just when we're around, we need to intentionally plan. It's important to cultivate leaders who can take over when we're not in charge anymore. Moses had worked to prepare Joshua. Calvin had cultivated a circle of leaders in Geneva and institutions to carry on when he died. But in addition to nurturing other leaders, we can continue to impact the world after we aren't in the picture anymore through what we're invested in. Now, this is, this is my plug to consider thinking about remembering the Middlebury Congregational Church in your will. So institutions can live far longer than us as individuals. So if we invest in institutions we care about, like MCC, we can ensure they continue to do work we care about long into the future. One of Calvin's passions was to set up a school to train new clergy for the Genevan churches. And because that institution was around, it caused the reforms in Geneva to endure. Now, in terms of how we view the people who lead us, both Moses and Calvin are good reminders that leaders are temporary. And good leaders are working towards ideas and goals that are greater than just themselves. As we approach election day, I believe this is a good caution for us. There's a very human tendency to invest our human leaders with all our hopes and dreams to the point where we even start to see our leaders as our saviors. However, leaders can and do fail. They get things wrong and disappoint us. And that's part of life. All our human leaders are elected to do a job, and that job isn't to be our savior. We have only one savior, Jesus Christ, and we should be careful lest we put our hope of salvation in the wrong place. We need to be careful not to confuse messengers for the message itself. And this is why Calvin and Moses both were buried in unmarked graves, to make sure people didn't get sidetracked from their messages to worship the messenger. One of my seminary professors, Bruce Gordon, wrote a biography of Calvin that I really enjoy. It's creatively entitled Calvin, if any of you are interested. And towards the end of the biography, Gordon's trying to explain Calvin's motivation for always working so hard and writing like he's running out of time. And Gordon says, it was Calvin's acute sensitivity to the gap between what was and what should be that distressed him. He knew there would be no new Jerusalem on earth, but he never stopped trying to build it. Calvin was working towards building up this kingdom on earth to be closer to the kingdom in heaven, even though he knew he wouldn't see it come to fruition in his lifetime. He was inspired by what could be. And this is a lot like Moses. Moses leads the people to the edge of the promised land. They've been heading towards the promised land for 40 years. Yet Moses doesn't actually get to go there. He merely surveys the land before his death. He's done all the work to bring the people to the promised land, but he doesn't get to see all that effort come to fruition. Now, he knew many chapters of scripture ago that he wouldn't get to go to Israel. But he kept on going forward anyway, because he was inspired by what could be, even if that would come after his death. And I think this is a really helpful attitude for us as the church and as individual Christians. Like Calvin, like Moses, like the sower in the parable from Matthew, we plant many seeds we won't get to see grow. We don't know the ripple effects from moments of kindness, care, or when we stepped into someone's life at just the right moment. As for the church, the church has been around for millennia. We're playing the long game here we're not always going to see results in our lifetime. We need to work towards the world as it should be, even if many of our short-term endeavors won't succeed or bear fruit in ways that we can see. 
So if we continue on with Hamilton references, there's a line during the song in the, which is during the duel during, uh, between Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr. And Hamilton says, legacy, what is a legacy? It's planting seeds in a garden you never get to see. So both Calvin and Moses were able to plant so many seeds in gardens they couldn't have imagined because they had a vision of the possibilities of God. The way the world is isn't the way the world has to be. But more than that, they had faith that one day the gap between the world as it is and the world as it should be would be gone. One day in the future, the harvest will come. And truly, that's what God has promised us, that in the end, all those seeds planted in gardens we didn't get to see won't be wasted. The bountiful harvest will come. In our scriptures, we've been given a vision of the world as it should be, a vision of the kingdom of God. And we've been told what kingdom values are. God is at work in the world and in all of us as we seek to advance God's kingdom of love, justice, peace, service, hope, humility, kindness, and truth, even if much of the time we don't see how we've made a difference. And at the end of all things, despite mistakes and failures, despite all the rocky ground and all those thorns, God will fulfill all things, and the bountiful harvest will come. So we, the church, need to trust in God's promises and possibilities and keep on sowing. Preacher and scholar Thomas Long puts it this way, the church is called to waste itself, to throw grace around like there's no tomorrow, precisely because there is a tomorrow and it belongs to God. Amen. <laughs>